Okay, well, my thought is right now, if God can use a donkey, he can use me, right? <laughs> so I'm willing. Praise the Lord. Um, Jay and his family, they are on vacation, so we're glad that they're taking some time off there in Colorado, and definitely I would say that they need some time. What, what am I supposed to do here, Kelby? Put it up higher? Is this good? More? Is that better? More? Okay. Okay. So they're in Colorado right now, and they have a really big family reunion, and everybody's getting together. So I would say that we have uh, great pastors, and I'm definitely thankful that they've taken some time off. So Jay had asked if I would be able to fill in for today, and... Uh, so I come here as your humble servant, and I do mean humble. <laughs> so what I really want to share today is, oh, gosh, yes. Okay. Obviously, it's very obvious that I'm, okay, my son is going to share about tithing. So we are going to take up an offering, and Joshua, do you want to come forward? Can he use a mic over here? We're going to take up an offering, and I just personally think it's really important to say something about tithe. You know, God doesn't need your money, okay? He doesn't need your money, but we tithe because that opens up a door for us. He has tithing because it opens up a door for us. And when we tithe... That is us giving to him. And so I asked Joshua, our oldest son, to share something about tithing because he's going to share how he knows that it works. So...
Patty, I'm amazed at this girl. She just started playing the piano not long ago, and I'm like, wow, look at her go already. And then she sang last Friday. I'm like, golly, that girl can sing. You're anointed. Receive it. Okay, well, I'm going to share about good news. I have good news. And you know, the, the gospel is good news. And sometimes I have um, been to a church, so to say, or heard different testimonials, I guess, and it did not sound like good news. It sounded like awful news. In fact, it made me think, if I didn't know the Lord, um, if I hadn't been raised in a Christian home and stuff, I'm just being honest, I would never come back again. Because I would think if that's how God is, whew, I got enough problems. So um, God has good news for you. It's always good news. It'll never be bad news. It's good news. And so that's what I'm going to share today. Um, I'm going to start off with Romans 1.16. I have some different stories I'll, I'll share with you about. But um, the first scripture is Romans 1.16. And she, we have it on the screen. I'm going to be sharing from um, Amplified. But Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ, for it is God's power working unto salvation for deliverance from death to everyone who believes. So he has good news for you, for everyone who believes. He made a way for you. Um, God made a way for you through his son, Jesus. Um, and Jesus brought us the good news. He really... When you go through the New Testament, everything he, that he did, you know, he was healing and people were being delivered and being set free. That, that's good news, okay? That's good. Okay, John 10.10, 10, um, but the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. And I come that you may enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full Till it overflows. Uh, okay, that does not sound like it, Jesus isn't the thief. Okay, God isn't the thief. Satan is the destroyer, and the only thing Satan has to us, so to say, is his deception, his lies. Anything he has, it's because he stole it. He stole it, and it's so important that we understand that we will not allow him, Satan, the thief, to keep stealing from us. Because if he's taken, if you feel like there's something you don't have or something that was taken from you, it was not God who took it from you. It's Satan who took that from you because he's the thief. Um, I looked up in the dictionary because it says, that they may enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Abundance. What is abundance? This is the dictionary. Having more than what you need. An oversufficient quantity or supply. Overflowing to the fullest. In great quantity. Well supplied. Extremely plentiful. Having more than enough. I mean, hello, right? More than enough. The synonym to abundance is plenteousness, plenteousness. The antonym to abundance is scarcity. So it's so important that we do not get confused with the two. Religion, if you ever feel confused, religion is confusing. It confuses you. It makes you think that God is not good. It makes you think God has something against you and he's going to get to you, that he really doesn't forgive you, that he really doesn't have a plan for you. That's religion, okay? Religion is bondage. God is not religion. God is freedom. Jesus came to set us free. 
And if you ever feel confused, it's because it, it's because you're you, me, whatever. We're focusing on the wrong thing, and we're not focusing on what His Word says. Um, so. My question is, I ask the question, you know, where did we get it that living with a scarcity mentality, you know, just barely making it and sad and being depressed. And it's sometimes, you know, you hear some, you know, God love them, but some Christian songs and it's like, golly, I mean, that's depressing, you know. There's no, um, uh, there's not a real answer, you know, in that. Um, it, but if you ever find yourself feeling sad and confused and scared and, or you're, you know, you're focusing on a sickness, um, don't feel like you have enough, all of those kind of thoughts and feelings, those are emotional feelings, that is a scarcity mentality and that's how Satan tries to grip you and to get you. He always goes through fear, okay, which is deception, deceiving you of what God has already paid for you. Am I getting this too close now? Is that too close? Okay. Okay. So I heard this. Um, how, how many of you have heard of Keith Moore? Anybody here hear Keith Moore? I love Keith Moore. He's great. And I really like his teaching. Um, he, um, he's one of my favorite teachers. But I heard him talk one time about vision and um, a videotape. And the scenario was that um, God has a videotape that's playing all the time. Satan has a videotape that's playing all the time. And Satan will play, that evil spirit, so to say, that it, it will play this videotape of your life constantly, constantly. And it will say, um, it'll tell you everything you've ever done wrong in your life. It'll remind you. It will put pictures before you where you failed or, um, or where you know you really went wrong. Or, I mean, it just plays that tape over and over and over again. And, um, but God has a videotape for you. And he is consistently trying to put that videotape before you again and again and again. But the enemy speaks death. Satan will always is the accuser. Um, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that accuses you, tells you you can't do it. God is the one that's tell, telling you that you can. He's always playing that videotape for you. Satan's video is you're pathetic. You're a screw-up loser, you know. Not this time. Well, other people have been healed, but not you because you've screwed up too much. Um, you can't do it, you know. Um, you're sick, you're too sick, no, you're not going to be well. Um, well, he wants other people to be well, but you've screwed up too much to be well. Um, he doesn't heal anymore. You're never going to have enough. You'll never have enough. You're not going to have this dream, this thing in your heart. This is not going to, but that's, how, that's what he plays. And if we focus on that, the way that you know you're focusing on the wrong thing is that you're going to feel really bad <laughs> and you're going to feel like you're literally losing energy and I just want to share with you friends um, that is the wrong thing to focus on it's so important to focus on his word because his word is power and his word is freedom and God has his videotape for you and he says you're going to make it he says you're a winner you're not a loser. You're a winner. I've made you more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I'm going to heal. I, yes, I heal you this time every time. I healed you 2,000 years ago. He said, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever things you've loosed on earth are loosed in heaven. He says that you are more than a conqueror. He says, I healed you. He says, the plans that I have for you are good. He said, I've given you authority. I've given you the authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions. We need to quit idolizing 
the devil, how bad he is. That's really like a form of worship almost, you know. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. But our gaze needs to be on him. Um, If a thought comes to you and it makes you feel defeated, it is not from God. It is not from him. Jesus speaks truth. His word is truth. He speaks truth into you. And the more that you focus on his word, the more that that truth starts to come in, in, into you. Um, and um, I, I want to... Um, okay, I got a story. I'm going to share this a little later. So... Um, People are confused, you know, I I mean, it seems like there's like this common thing that you hear people say is, well, we live in a fallen world. Well, we live in a fallen world. Well, yeah, we do. We do live in a fallen world, but Jesus took the keys and he stripped Satan of every piece of authority that he ever had. So, yeah, we live in a fallen world, but Jesus took it. And he gave it to you. And the blood of Jesus, you know, I love that there's power in the name in, in the name of Jesus. There's no other name. In fact, when you think about the promises that he's given us, um, he's given us everything we need. There's nothing lacking. And when we sense that lack in our heart, in our spirit, it's not from him. It is not God. And so our gaze has got to be straightforward on him. Can I ask for some a drink of water, bottled water, glass of water? Anybody? Oh, thank you, Addie. I appreciate it. She must be a pearl. She's servant. <laughs> if you went to my chems class, you would know that. Okay. We live in a fallen world that Jesus redeemed you of the curse. Um, Thank you. So that, I love Galatians 3.13. That's like one of my favorite scriptures. I started to focus on Galatians 3.13. Um, it's been a while ago. Eight years ago, nine years ago. And I honestly, I read that scripture every day for probably eight years. I read it that much. Because I knew that one of the reasons why, um, oh, there it is. (laughs) Um, I knew that one of the reasons why that people weren't getting or I was not receiving uh, different things is because I did not have that in my mind that Jesus had redeemed me from the curse. There are curses out there. Um, There's curses in your family. Um, You might be the nicest people ever, but there's curses out there. And, but Jesus redeemed us from that curse. When it says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Jesus being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree and is crucified. He took the curse. He took the curse so we don't have to take it. And if you um, feel yourself struggling with something, remind the enemy that you do not live under the curse anymore, that you're no longer under the curse. There's a lot of different things out there, curses out there. It's not a part of you. I mean, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. People go on and on about in their family, and there's cancer, and there's this, and I'm like, shut up. You know what I mean? Stop it. We're redeemed of the curse. We don't have to put up with that. That's not a part of our life. Oh, okay. See, that's confusing. That makes you feel confused. Religion is confusing. Hosea 4, 6, for my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, okay? Okay. When the word isn't first place in our life, when we don't understand the word, that's how the enemy can come and just absolutely beat you over the head because you, we don't understand what the word says. 
And the bottom line is the word. And I will tell you, I've done things that was not what the word said. And let me just tell you, it doesn't work. It will not work. Only his word works. And, and things flow so much more. And it doesn't mean you're going to have attacks, but you, it, that's why we've got to have our mind renewed by the word of God. And when our mind is renewed by the word of God, that's how we understand what the answers are. We're, of course, praying in the spirit, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, the Bible is our instruction booklet, okay? It's our instruction book. And so he's the one that wrote the instruction book. Um, I got a story, and that is um, there's a man by the name of Thurman Scrivener, and he um, was very smart. He was a um, mechanical engineer, and he worked on aircrafts. He lived in Dallas, Texas. And there was a Boeing airplane that he was, um, he was supposed to start working on. It was very complex. Um, it was very difficult for them to understand it. And um, they had um, teachers come in and try to teach and train them on understanding how this Boeing worked. And none of these, none of these engineers could figure it out. It took them, still one month went by, nobody, it was so difficult to understand. So they finally decided to fly in the man who created the Boeing, fly him into Dallas, and be the one to train. And he went through and trained them, and he said, and you know what? It was the easiest thing ever to understand. Why? Because that man created that aircraft. God gave you the answers. He made you. He has a plan for you. He's smart, smarter than you and me. And he has our answers. So we can't get away from his instruction booklet because when we do, that's when things don't work out right. You know, and it's interesting people blame it on God. It is not God's fault. It's our fault. We have to look at ourselves in the mirror because he gave us the instructions. Okay. Psalm 138.2 says, For you have exalted above all else your name and your word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. And I used, not, I used to not understand that. I didn't understand, and I thought, why did God say that his word was above his name? I, I used to not understand that. But as I started to understand the word of God and how his word will always work and realizing that he could never lie, then it made sense to me because God cannot lie. He cannot lie. So when he spoke, when he spoke planets into existence, he spoke you know, stars, and there was dark, and then there was light, and he spoke the oceans. You notice that the oceans come up, and then they go back, and they come up. I mean, isn't that amazing? It's because he spoke it. And so, because of his word, he is bound to his word, and he cannot lie. And so, his word is above his name because, I mean, his name is his word, but his word it trumps all. It trumps all. Um, Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void without producing any effect. So when you're speaking the word of God, it does, it has power in it, and it does produce. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And so you're speaking the word of God, and it's alive, and it's full of power. And, you know, um, this is not positive thinking, um, positive speaking, because positive speaking alone does not have power in it. But the word of God, ha and it will kind of help you a little bit, but really it won't help you a lot because there's no power in it, but his word is positive anyway, but his word has power yeah. in it. Yeah. And so um, it's going to prosper. It will prosper because you're planting a seed. And hit, when you're planting that seed, 
it's going to grow. And you grow, how does it grow? It grows, oh, we got a farmer over here, Mr. Paul Wishman. But it grows because you're watering it. You're planting the seed and you're watering it and you're putting it into the ground. Okay, and that ground, that soil does everything that it can to produce as much as possible from that seed. And that's the word of God. And that's what you're doing. You're planting things in your heart. Um, I had shared this years ago, but um, when I came here and, and, and spoke or preached, but there is a book that I highly recommend. And this man has passed away, but I really like him a lot. His name, it, it, I'm sure some of you have heard of Charles Katz. And um, he, you like him? Isn't he good? Um, he has a book. I mean, I have used this. This thing is just kind of pathetic, actually, but I love it so much. And um, it really breaks down the Word of God, and it helps you to understand why the Word is so powerful. It's called Faith and Confession. And he goes through um, why things don't work and for people and, and why they do work and how his whole life changed because he spoke the word of God. And um, my very good friend, my best friend, Kim Mills, she told me about that book, and I ordered it years ago. And I began to read it, and I started to realize that there are basic fundamentals of faith. There are basic fundamentals that it's so important that we understand. And so on the back, they have Bible scriptures that you can read. And so one of them, I would just read... And granted, you got to realize is that I had a lot of sinus infections, and I'm not kidding. I would get a sinus infection every two weeks. So, like, you kind of finish that sinus infection, and then it would start again two weeks later. And I had taken antibiotics to a point where my body just, you know, just resisted it, and I couldn't take it. And so, anyway, um, I got this book, and... I started to read in the back here about that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. According to Galatians 3.13, Jesus became a curse for us. And uh, Matthew 16.19, Jesus said, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever things we've loosed on earth are loosed in heaven. And I began to read these scriptures and speak over my body because I had so many different things. I had um, stomach issues and had patches on my eye. Um, and um, I had no feeling, okay? There was no emotional feeling when I spoke this. I didn't, oh, wow, I feel something there. I didn't feel anything. Um, and I just kept speaking. And about two months later, I remember I thought, huh, I can tell. I can just tell something. I can tell I don't have as much pressure. And three months later, I noticed even more so and I kept speaking, and you know, I just can't even tell you how many things the Lord healed in me, and that proved to me so much that God's word works. Um, I'll just share with you, um, I had, when I was pregnant with Chance, I, I started to get this patch on my forehead, and it was strange. It literally felt like elephant skin. And that started to cover all on my forehead. You couldn't see it, but if you went like this, you could feel it. And then it started to go down, and then it started all going down my neck. And last summer, as it's, I could feel it, I'm like, okay, what am I? I'm not even coming against this. I'm just putting up with it. You know, I was using all these scrubs and stuff, and um, nothing was working. And so finally I'm like, I haven't taken authority over this. I have not even taken authority over this. I haven't spoken over my body. I thought, what am I thinking? And so I began to speak over my body and commanding it to leave. And I'm not kidding, probably five days, seven days later, there was where the patch started. It's almost weird where the patch started. There was the skin that was completely cleared. And I was like, oh, praise God, it's working, it's working. And I used... Um, Job 33, 24, and 25. I had it on my bathroom mirror. It says, I have found a ransom for you. Your flesh shall be fresher than a child's, and you shall return to the days of your youth. And I spoke that, and I'm not kidding. 
I can't even imagine how much money I would have had to spend if I went to a dermatologist and Jesus doesn't send a medical bill. Isn't that cool? He doesn't bill you. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> and it was gone. It completely went away. So that's a basic fundamental right there, okay? So number one, I'm just going to give you a couple of um, basics here. What does God say? So kind of everything that I just shared, what does God say? What does he say? What does his word say? That's number one. And do you believe he's good? Because, see, if you have this thing inside of you that you don't think he's good, you're really not going to trust his word. You're going to think that it, really, that it doesn't apply to you. But it applies to you if you are a child of God. It applies to you. Um, number two, what are you saying? What are you speaking? Uh, quick story here. Kenneth Hagen, and if Keith is listening to this someday, he'll probably correct me, which is totally fine, because he would have heard this story several times. But I remember hearing a story from Kenneth Hagen, and he shared about a man. Now, this is a basic law about your tongue and how important it is on what you speak. And there was a man, I don't remember if it was in his congregation um, because he used to be a pastor, but this man um, either was going to be 40 or 41. Can't remember, but let's just say he's going to be 40. And he died about one month before he turned 40. He was in the hospital bed. Kenneth Hagin went to go pray for him. And when he went to go pray for him, the Lord said, no. No. And he thought, that can't be God. And he goes over to reach again, and before he could touch this man, the Lord said, no. When I wrote it down, he said, there are things, there are laws that have been set into motion that cannot change. They cannot be changed. And so three times he extended his hand. The Lord told him, no, it's not going to do any good. Now that's kind of weird, right? Like, Why? So he, um, at the funeral service, afterwards, he, he spoke to um, his brother and sister, whatever, his family. And they said, you know what? That's interesting you would say that. Because he, not, he would say all the time, even when he was a kid. And as he got older, he would say, yeah, I'll never, I'll never see 40. Yeah, I'll, I won't ever see 40. Yeah. I, I, I bet I won't be old. I don't want to be old. I'll just probably live up to 40. Isn't that interesting? Died one month before he turned 40 because he spoke it, and he spoke it, and he said it, and he said it, and he said it. God couldn't even change it because he spoke it so many times that laws were set into motion. And so our mouth is so important by what we say. Um, gravity is a basic law. And so your tongue, our tongues, what we say is just a basic. And so um, gravity is a basic law. And I don't care how much you praised and worshiped the Lord today or for a week straight. Let's say that you fasted for 30 days and you worshiped the Lord and you got up on the building and you jumped off. Gravity says you're going to fall, okay? <laughs> and these are basic laws. So when we break a basic law, it won't work. God's word is a basic law. Faith is a basic fundamental. Speaking is a basic fundamental. And it will always work whether you're the nicest Christian in the whole world. It doesn't matter. <laughs> His basic laws will be what works. That's what works. You know, it's not, and I know this is a religious cow. I'm going to kick right now, okay, with my high heels. And, um, but a religious cow is, you know, oh, I just don't understand. They're the ni the, they were always at church. Nicest person you met, always at church. But there's a lot of things we don't understand about that, and I'm not trying to knock anybody down, okay? But I'm saying that there are basic laws, and 
It doesn't matter how nice someone is, how much they went to church. If you break what God says in his word, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. I can feel my ruby coming out. I got ruby. That's ruby right there. That's my husband. <laughs> Rubies are. Okay. Um, so there are certain laws that are set into motion with our tongue. Good or bad. Oh, and it says in Proverbs, and I might have just skipped that scripture. I think I don't think I put it in. But it does say that life and death are in the power of the tongue. They who indulge in it shall eat the fruit thereof, good or evil. You eat good or evil, what you speak, okay? So that's why that videotape that's being played in your head is really important. So the word of God, you, your words control your mind. And um, when we're speaking the word of God, it helps to frame our thinking and it helps to have those thoughts in our mind of what, he's share, of what he's telling about us, okay? And your words control your destiny because your mind is telling you where to go and what to do. Your head really, you know, your mind does that. And mind is a powerful thing, but it's also polluted. And have you not noticed the media is really trying hard to pollute our minds? There's so much stuff out there that try to pollute our mind. And that's why it's so important that we are not swayed. Um, <clears throat> how do you change your mind? How do you change your thinking? You know, how do we change this? We can't just say positive, you know, positive words. We've got to speak what the word says. We've got to understand and know what does the word say. And I would share this, that if this is something that you really feel like you need to work on, I would suggest that you get this book. Um, because it's a great basic um, that he goes through. So, again, it's called Faith and Confession, Charles Katz. Okay, so I'm going to share this. I have shared this before, but I think it's worth sharing. And that is, um, I'm sure as some of you might know this, but, um, you know, we had Joshua. So, we had Joshua, and there's a seven-year gap between Joshua and Chance, and the reason why there is a seven-year gap is because I had four miscarriages. I had four miscarriages after I had Joshua. And I'm telling you, you know, a miscarriage is, is very difficult. Um, and um, when I was pregnant the, the fourth time after I had Joshua, um, I mean, I thought I was doing pretty good, and, and um, they always say, if you're nauseous, it's a good sign, that type of thing. And I will say that I, I do remember losing, you know, not feeling nauseous. Of course, again, I didn't understand Galatians 3.13, so I was accepting being nauseous. But um, it was in month four, so that's always a good sign. When you're in month four, you're pretty much, um, you know, that's considered as a really good thing. And I was in month four. And um, I had went, Joshua and I went to see Barry in Dallas, and I was coming back, and man, I could tell something wasn't right. And it was, it was awful. Um, I miscarried again. It was devastating, devastating. I had to be taken by ambulance. I was in so much pain. Barry's business partner had to come get me because I, I couldn't even walk. And... Um, I had to be taken by ambulance, and um, I was taken to Wamigo, and then I was taken to Manhattan, and I lost that baby, and it it was so hard. I'm talking, you know, it's like I'm saying this now, and I feel like crying, and I just gave up, you know, and uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ever want to have to go through that kind of pain ever again. And my husband was like, no, I do not want to give up. And I was like, oh, I can't even imagine, you know, going through something again. And, um, but anyway, got pregnant again. And <laughs> I called my husband, I'm pregnant. <laughs> he was happy. And I was sad, you know. 
Um, but I did tell myself that if I ever get pregnant again, I'm going to see this one doctor, which this woman told me to go see. And, um, and I remember I told myself, I'm going to do it completely different. I am not going to do it the same. I got a different doctor, not because I didn't like the doctor, but because I had to have a vision of some, somewhere else, being in a waiting room somewhere else. I went to Council Grove. Actually, the doctor there in Council Grove, she was great. And um, the doctor that I saw in Kansas City, he said to me, if there's anybody that you know that's negative, um, don't hang around them because you don't, you don't want to be around them. You're, you're going to carry this baby. And he said, you will carry this baby, but don't hang around anybody that you don't think um, that doesn't think that you can have this baby. And um, we went through a lot. I mean, it was almost like there was this emotional roller coaster of, yeah, things are good, no, things aren't as good, that kind of thing. And so we went through that a lot. And I remember I got a phone call from the doctor in Council Grove, and she said, we took the blood test, and according to this, they're thinking that there could be Down syndrome. And so um, they said, and Josh was looking at Chance right now and uh, <laughs> laughing, just like a big brother would do. I knew he would do that. And, um, um, and I said, um, you know, of course, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I told my husband, and my husband goes, you know, I'm about had it with the devil yanking our chain all over the place. I'm done. So... If this child's born with a peg leg and a patch on his eye, that sounds like Barry Patterson, but if this child is born with a peg leg and a patch eye, I'm going to love this child. But I do not believe God took us this far to leave us. And he laid hands on me and prayed for me. And we prayed for him. We prayed and we prayed and spoke life. And praise God, um, in the mail came this CD from Pat Robertson on faith, the basic fundamentals of faith. And I kid you not, now I didn't hear anybody talking about faith, and really this is before YouTube really was available and all that kind of thing. So um, I listened to that CD. I honestly think I listened to that CD a hundred times because I would listen to it twice a day. Um, and what I started to notice is faith came faith started to rise up. And you know, if we would have thought about being victims, and this is so, you know what I'm saying? That's not faith. But we had to focus on the victory. And um, the night before um, I was to go into the hospital, Barry and I were in Council Grove, and neither of us got a whole lot of sleep. <laughs> you know, but I just... We would spoke over this baby, and I said, in, I remember every night I'd say, in the name of Jesus, this baby is perfect. And when this child is born, that doctor will say, this baby is beautiful. And I said that every night. And when that baby was born, that is what the doctor said. The doctor said, what a beautiful baby. In fact, he started to cry before they even slapped him. I mean, he was already crying. And they go, ooh, that's a good sign. And, uh, you know, and they, and they said, oh, he's beautiful. He's perfect. He's perfect. And God said, you name him Chance. When I took a shower, the Lord told, said, you name him Chance for God of a second chance. That's why he's named Chance. What? Praise God. <laughs> Uh Baby brother. <laughs> Joshua was seven years old 
And Joshua asked me, the first question he asked me when I was wheeled out was, Mommy, how old will he be seven years from now? <laughs> seven? <laughs> he couldn't understand why he couldn't play football as soon as we got in through the doors. <laughs> he was ready to play football. Okay. Do you see yourself as an overcomer? God does. Do you see yourself as an overcomer? He does. He sees you as an overcomer. He sees you as more than a conqueror. You have a V. On, everybody has a V on their forehead. You are either the victim or the victor. You choose. Your victim story helps nobody. And I guarantee you there's a lot of people here, and they have some really tough stories to share. I mean, my heart breaks when I share, when I share, when I hear people share about stories and stuff they've been through. You know, my mom is here today. My mom could have been a victim. My mother could have been a victim. She lost her mom at the age of six years old. And um, she, um, she had a lot of responsibilities as a very young girl. And she had a dad, and I think I'm sharing this correctly, that he didn't tell you that he loved you. He saw to it that she was taken care of, you know, but he was kind of gruff, and he didn't hug her and stuff, and he didn't say that he loved her. And my mom, praise the Lord, married a great guy, my dad, but my mom, I'm, I think my mom's okay that I share this in front of all these people, um, <laughs> but my mom was mad, you know, she was upset because she felt like she didn't really have a childhood. And, and so my mom was kind of that victim person, you know? And she didn't feel that she had a childhood. She didn't feel like she got to be a little girl. She didn't feel like she got to do a lot of fun things, you know? She didn't have a mom to do all those things with her. And my mom kind of lived out a victim for a while, you know? My mom's a great mom, and you're going to hear the other part of this. But, um, you know, she... She didn't. But my mom will tell you that didn't work, did it? <laughs> and then my parents started going to full gospel business meetings. And that was the first time they started to hear about the Word of God. What does the Word of God do? It tells you you're a victor. It tells you you have victory. It tells you there's a different way to do in this. Instead of feeling sorry for yourself and sucking your thumb, that's what the Word of God does to us. It doesn't make us a victim. It makes us a victor. And we all have stories. You know, that's why burning down a building and having a riot and tearing down a statue means you, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. It is Jesus who set us free, and we do not have to be the victim, but we can be victors. And there's going to be some days... You're gonna have. You're gonna fall maybe a hundred times, a hundred times a day. You're gonna have to remind yourself that Jesus gave you the power, that He bring good news to you, that you're free, that you don't have to be that way. Um, I don't have any special anointing to resist. The only thing I know is that I, I just have to keep the Word of God um, before me. I got a long ways to go, you guys. I've got a long, 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 long ways to go. Just because I'm up here doesn't mean that I got every answer, but the one answer that I can say is that I have seen that God's word works, and it makes me excited to see how his word will work in other areas. But my mom and dad, they started to go to full gospel meetings, and, and then um, Living Word Church was created, and she was at the altar a lot, <laughs> a lot, and cried a lot. And she had to forgive, didn't you, Mom? She had to forgive. She had to let go of her past. She had to forgive. She had to let go of the fact that her dad didn't show her any love and that she didn't ever experience love. But I want to share with you something. My mom broke the curse. She broke it. My mom broke the curse. How much power does that give a mother to a daughter or to a son? Does it give power to a daughter to go, oh, that's awful. That's terrible. Oh, that's just terrible. 
She didn't do that. And my mom had tough love too, you know. It was when we were kids, it wasn't wait till your dad got home, it was wait till your mom got home. <laughs> and she always smelled something burning, always. I think I, I got home yesterday and go, what do I smell? I smell something, I'm a lot like her. But you know why I called the coffee business that I started to create? You want to know why I called it Dots? Because I love my mom. I love my mom. I want something to be named after my mom because she overcame. She overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of her testimony. My mom overcame. She, she set an example for me as a daughter that women overcome. She set an example to me as her daughter that you overcome. And I can't tell you how many times my mom has said to me, you can do it, you can do it. You know, she doesn't play a violin. Somebody else that doesn't play a violin is my husband. He does not play a violin. But my husband too, he has that good tough love about him because he's got that tough love. Those are your real friends. Your real friends are people that have tough love for you and don't feel sorry for you. That's not your friend. Your friend is somebody who has tough love for you. And compassion is, you call me. We're going to go through these scriptures. We're going to pray together, and you're going to get through this. That's a real friend. Jesus was a real friend. Jesus was a real friend. Jesus went and found the woman that had been married, what, four or five times. He went all the way, you know, Rex can t correct me on this. I want to say she was a woman of Samaria. Am I totally wrong? Am I wrong? What? I'm good. Oh, praise God. And found her, found her. It's interesting, she was at the well in the afternoon. Everybody would have gotten water in the morning. She went in the afternoon. Why? I'm sure because she was ashamed, and she knew that they would make fun of her because she'd been married so many times, and the man she was married and the man she was living with was not her husband. Who did Jesus go see? He went to the one who was like society says a screw-up. But Jesus knew. He knew. And guess what? What did that woman do? She went and told everybody. Tell a woman, and boy... You get it done. <laughs> We're good at that. <laughs> we like to talk. She told him. She spread the gospel. He used her. Uh, Rahab. This is not even in my notes. But Rahab. He used Rahab. He's not looking for perfect. He's not looking for perfect. He's looking for somebody who is willing to take his word. That's who he's looking for you got to understand your authority. If you don't understand your authority and be consistent with it, you're going to be knocked down. You're going to have, honestly, it's going to be really hard. So it's so important that you understand your authority. Luke 10, 19, you know, I don't have that in my notes, but Jesus said, Behold, I've given you authority, power, authority to cast out demons. I gave you the authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall by any means hurt you or harm you. It doesn't have the right to hurt you or harm you. Um, okay, and I end with this scripture. Years ago, I'm not sure how long ago this was, maybe six years ago, my husband had a Bible scripture theme for his basketball team, and it was Matthew 11, 12. Matthew 11, 12, and that says... From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. And again, that was one of those scriptures I never understood, and he had that as his theme scripture. And one of the reasons why he had that as his theme scripture is because the kingdom of God does suffer violence. We do suffer violence. Satan is always coming against that and trying to cause that into our lives. But the violent, that's where you have to understand your authority. The violent take it by force. The violent, it's not, it's the violent take it by force. We have to take it by force. It doesn't mean you're rude to people, but it does mean that you've got to understand. No, devil, this is the line, and you're not going to cross this. This is the line, and you will not cross this. And, you, you know, we have to, re, you, it's our responsibility to do that, to, to tell him that, okay? Um, 
So I really like that scripture because it makes so much sense that we that we're not prey to Satan's attacks. And it doesn't mean he's not going to attack. That's not what that means. It means that we have got to understand and put on our armor to understand that we do not have to suffer that, but that we are the ones that know I will take it by force, okay? Um, and because Satan was stripped of his power. All right, we're going to, um, I have a um, video. Well, I don't think the video is going to play. And hold on one second. Have it paused, and I'll let you know when I want it to play. Um, <clears throat> but if you are somebody and you feel that um, you struggled in that area, you struggled in the fact that you're wondering if God is good because of some things that you've gone through, let me encourage you today that God is a good God. I tell you, I get overwhelmed by his goodness. Overwhelmed. He sent people in my life to, Joy Bullock is one of them. She's not here anymore at this church, but man, what a powerful woman. He sent Joy Bullock in my life. I never prayed and asked God to send somebody in my life. He did it because he's good. He sent me a woman in my life in Pennsylvania when I was so confused. I was a part of a ministry, and everything in that ministry was, you're a horrible person, you're a sinner, you're awful, you're a screw-up, you know? Pray more, pray more, pray more. Up, ah, didn't pray enough. I mean, it was, it was a bad ministry. They didn't start like that, but boy, they got... And you know what's interesting is, when you treat people like that, guess what happens? Sin abounds, sin abounds. People get worse. They don't get better, they get worse, because they're so beat down. I was so beat down. And God is so good because he sent me this woman, April. I don't even remember her last name, and I've tried to see if I could find her on Facebook. But um, that woman said, have her stay with me for three months when you guys come back around in September. Pick her up. But I want her to stay with me. And I'm telling you, God used that woman. My mind got renewed, and I saw that ministry for what they were worth, which was not good. I got out of that ministry and moved home where I needed to be and sat down with Pastor Gary. <laughs> good man. Good man. And he helped me to get my thinking on straight. And then I got to be a part of a youth group with Joy Bullock. God sent me somebody else. I never even asked the Lord for somebody. I didn't even ask him. He sent me somebody anyway. That's because we got a good God. We have a good God. And if you're feeling today that maybe he's not that good or you're having a hard time, I want you to know he's good. I can pray with you if you don't know who the Lord is. Today's a great day to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And guess what? He's not going to tell you you're a failure. He's going to tell you you're a winner. He's going to tell you that he has a plan for your life. He's going to show you only love, only unacceptable, oh, uh, I mean, only acceptable love. That's all. And you receive him as, he, you will not be disappointed with him. Will you have some hard times? Yes, you will. Yes, you will. But guess what? He's got an answer. He'll have, are you going to do everything perfect? Nope. Nope. You're going to have some tough days? Yeah. But God loves you. And he has a plan for your life. And he is a good God. And he only extends out goodness to you. So we have a song. I've got a song here. It's just a song on YouTube, but I love this song. And um, listen to the words. And if you feel that you're someone that you need to revisit that goodness of God because you feel that you've had some tough things. And here, and I want to just say something. This isn't wapo zappo, you know what I mean? And then boom, you know, all your problems are over. Because, see, it's your responsibility to go through the word of God and renew your mind. You've got to take that responsibility. You could come up for prayer every Sunday, every Wednesday night, and it's not going to do any good if you're not willing 
to let God wash you with his word. But if you'll just give God a chance, if you'll just give him a chance, he'll show you his goodness. He will show you his goodness. So, okay, let's go ahead. If that's you, feel free to come forward. And I'm going to sing a little bit with it. And I'm just going to be led by the Spirit. God, we believe. Yes, we can see. Wonders are still what you do. Thank you, Jesus. And bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. Because God, we believe. Yes, we can see. Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Let him do what he wants to do in your life. Don't hold back. Please don't hold back.
just play it for now. So I'm just going to uh, pray for anybody that needs prayer. It might be that you uh, have a hard time. Maybe it is that you do know that God is good. Maybe you do know.
your hands towards Shayla.
I bind you, Satan, inoperable over her, over any addictions in the name of Jesus. Get out. Hallelujah. Get out. No. No. Okay, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. He's just saying, I'm Lord, and my name is the highest of all names, and there are no addictions, no more addictions, because his name is the highest. Ooh, because there's power in the name. every chain, every chain, every chain, chains bind, his word sets us free, his word sets us free. Hallelujah. So the next time he tries to remind you, the enemy would try to remind you, go back to the Like you are his favorite, okay? <laughs> That's how much he loves you. You're his favorite. I think we just need to be reminded of this. Praise God. No condemnation in Christ. It doesn't mean you just try to sin and try to do. It means there's no condemnation. He throws it as far as the east is from the west. Praise God. And he's not done. He is not done. say thank you. We want to say thank you for setting us free, for being reminded of how good you are. We want to thank you for your word and Lord that it has sunk in into our hearts and that we're going to take a nugget, something that we've heard and use it Lord as, as a weapon toward the enemy but also as a knowing that you see us, Lord, that, that we're winners, and but Lord, that, that it's good news that you have for us. Always good news. Always good news. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That we focus on you. Focus on you today, during the week. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We glorify
by your name, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.